So it is my pleasure to introduce our third and uh, final speaker for this evening, Dr. Menaka Pai. Dr. Pai completed her medical training at McMaster University and at the University of Toronto. She has been a hematologist and thrombosis specialist at McMaster University since 2008. She is currently an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and head of service for benign hematology at Hamilton Health Sciences. And she's also a quality lead for transfusion medicine in the Hamilton Regional Laboratory Medicine Program. Dr. Pai holds a master's degree in health research methodology. She is a member of McMaster University's Thrombosis and um, Atherosclerosis Research Institute, and also of the McMaster Center for Transfusion Research. Her research interests include venous thromboembolism, research methods in rare diseases, clinical practice guideline development, and quality improvement. Dr. Pai. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Pierre. I'm uh, I'm really honored to be speaking to you all today about VIT uh, following adenoviral vector COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm going to go through my slides a little quickly because um, I, I do want to leave time for, for questions. I have no current financial nor intellectual conflicts of interest to declare. Um, today, we're going to talk about vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, the suspected pathophysiology, rapid identification of the syndrome, as I expect many of you are really on the front lines of making this diagnosis. And then we'll talk about treatment. Um, this is a newly described syndrome, lots of unanswered questions, so we will touch on that as well. Uh, I'm going to start with a case. Now, this is not a real patient, but this is a, a composite of many cases. We've already had eight reported cases of VIT in this country and many hundreds of reported cases around the world. Uh, this is a 56-year-old woman who received her first dose of the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine 12 days ago at her local pharmacy. She presents to her family physician today with a severe headache. It's gone on for two days. Nothing's helping. It's so bad that it makes her feel nauseous. And she's developed blurred vision and diplopia this morning. Um, her medical history is, is really very bland. Now, when she presents at the local emergency room, a routine CBC is done, presenting platelet count dramatically low at 31, and there's really no other abnormalities on, on the blood film. So this patient is obviously ill. Um, your question as a physician is what's going on, and does the vaccine she received have anything to do with it? So as I mentioned, VIT is a newly described syndrome, and there are some key features that I want you to remember. First, patients have blood clots. They are generally in unusual sites, like the cerebral veins or the splanchnic circulation. Uh, however, there can also be more garden variety clots anywhere really in arterial or venous territories. Patients also have a thrombocytopenia, usually quite significant. And the patient's actually generally healthy before presentation. Now, there's no uh, signal of affected patients having anything specific in their medical history, and I'll talk about that more in, in the next slide. Despite their general good health, early reports uh, stated a case fatality of 40%. Now, um, with the increased uh, awareness and quicker diagnosis and treatment, we believe the case fatality is now around 19%. Now, the syndrome's onset is also very stereotyped. So symptoms start between four and 28 days following vaccination. And this time frame actually gives us some clues as to what's going on. So what you're seeing at right is not a diagram of Bits pathophysiology. It's a diagram of an analogous condition called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. In HIT, some patients who receive heparin develop antibodies to a complex of heparin, which is a, a charged polyanion, and platelet factor 4. Um, the PF4 is a small, positively charged molecule that normally sits inside platelet granules. Now, these antibodies to that PF4 heparin complex, they stick to platelets and they activate them. So the end result is that you have platelets that are switched on, they're very prothrombotic, they start this coagulation storm, and then the platelet count falls because activated platelets are rapidly cleared. And you can get blood clots in venous or arterial territories. 
Now in VIT, there is no heparin in the mix. These patients have not received it. Um, however, we do see similar antibodies that have developed to platelet factor four and some as yet unidentified polyanion. And the result, coagulation storm, activated and cleared platelets, detectable antibodies is exactly the same. Now, the incidence of it has been really challenging to um, calculate. It, it, uh, right now, we believe the possible incidence is about 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 100,000 doses. And, and a lot of that depends on how we count um, vaccine adverse events. In Canada, because we gave the COVID shield vaccine for a very defined period of time, we can actually tell you that the incidence is, is truly 1 in 50,000. It does appear that younger patients are, are predisposed to VIT. Perhaps there's a slight predominance of, of women. Um, what I can tell you is that there are no clear risk factors. So things that you see here, whether it's previous clots, uh, the use of hormones, having a platelet disorder, none of that seems to put patients at increased risk. So we really can't risk stratify who is susceptible. If your jurisdiction uses adenoviral vector COVID-19 vaccines, so that's AstraZeneca, Covishield, uh, or the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you need to be aware of it. You need to have some level of comfort diagnosing and managing it. And, and the algorithm that is on your screen right now is part of Thrombosis Canada's guidance, which is really uniquely tailored to the Canadian context. So we've tried to create something that really captures the clinical care of VIT right from patient presentation onto the point of treatment. Now, one note I'm, as we move forward, you've probably seen this syndrome called many different names um, like VIPIT or TTS. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna use VIT just because it's, it's easy to say, but the terms are really quite interchangeable. Now, it's important to remember that VIT is a serious adverse event. So as I said, the reported case fatality can be as high as 40%. And now we have some experience with VIT in this country, and I can tell you that you know, these clots are really aggressive. But the symptoms, they, they feel really maddeningly common. Because the syndrome itself is rare, and the symptoms uh, seem a little ubiquitous, it's important not just to rule VIT in, so you can quickly start life-saving treatment, but also to rule VIT out because you want to make sure patients who don't have it don't get a lot of unnecessary diagnostics or treatments. We have to be very transparent about this adverse event and, and spot it when it comes up, but we also have to reassure patients and clinicians that not every headache after a vaccine needs aggressive workup. So uh, that's why I like to sort of approach the problem in three stages. You start with a suspected VIT, you know, a patient who's presenting to really any healthcare setting with some nonspecific symptoms, you can do a very straightforward workup at that time. If that workup is positive, you move the patient to a more acute care setting, like an emergency department for advanced tests and imaging. And finally, if you have a presumptive diagnosis, you confirm it with specialized testing and you give empiric treatment. And I'm going to go through these things um, quickly. So the first step in working up VIT is to listen to the patient's story. Um, though the symptoms seem really nonspecific, all of the reported cases follow a clear pattern. I have quite a laundry list here of symptoms and you can find them all in Thrombosis Canada's guidance. But what's really important to remember is it's not just typical symptoms of arterial venous clots, it's a typical time frame. The symptoms start four to 28 days post-vaccination. Now, once VIT is on your radar, what do you do to pursue the diagnosis? Well, again, focus on basic workup. Focus on things with a high negative predictive value. Now, the really key step I feel at this stage when you think something's going on is to draw a complete blood count. Now, this test, if it can be resulted quickly, you can do it in a family physician's office. But to move things along, you can certainly do this and get results often quicker um, in a setting like the ER. When you get your CBC results back, focus on the platelet count. So in all reported cases of VIT, that platelet count is between 10 and 110. So it is, it is low. Um, and the median count is about 20 to 30. Now in diseases like HIT, we wonder about the patient's platelet drop from baseline. But of course, because these patients are healthy, we often don't have a baseline platelet count. So really just focus on the CBC and the platelet count in front of you. 
If your platelets are not decreased, this is sufficient to rule VIT out. You still have to work up the symptoms, of course, but a low platelet count, often an impressively low platelet count, that keeps the diagnosis in play and it gives you that label of suspected VIT. And the next step is to focus on more advanced tests, including the D-dimer, the blood film, and appropriate imaging. Now, VIT appears to be associated with, with really strong systemic coagulation activation. So, you know, as you're converting fibrinogen into fibrin and you're laying clots down and it gets broken up, you're going to see an elevation in the D-dimer, generally over 2,000, nearly always over 4,000. Um, now, our algorithm um, doesn't demand that additional uh, coagulation testing is done, but if the fibrinogen um, is drawn, it will often be low. The PT and the PTT are generally decreased too. The blood film is important because of what it doesn't show. So in VIT, you should not see red cell fragmentation. You should not see platelet clumping. You should just see low platelets. Now, imaging is required to diagnose thrombosis. Generally, this is very important in this syndrome. I'm not going to review this in, in detail, but what I will remind people, because I think the trickiest clot of it is really the cerebral sinus vein thrombosis. Um, I would encourage you um, to remember that a non-contrast CT head is actually not sensitive enough to rule out CSVT if you really are suspecting one. Um, you can do an MR and MR venogram, or if that's hard to get in your center, it's hard to get in my center, you can do a plain CT and a CT venogram. So again, you have to sort of do both the, the, the plain imaging and also the venographic imaging. Um, and finally, before I move to my next slide on testing, we do have a couple of reports of patients who have really demonstrable VIT with all of the confirmatory testing, but they don't have a blood clot. Now, these cases seem to be very rare. They might represent a pre-VIT syndrome, so it means you caught it before clotting has happened. If your clinical suspicion is high and you can't find a clot, then send off testing anyways, call a hematologist or thrombosis specialist, and consider treatment as a presumptive diagnosis of VIT. The important thing about this syndrome is not to be um, frightened, but really to keep your radar up. If you don't consider VIT, um, you will miss it. I am uh, not going to go into detail on testing, but I'm going to make a couple of comments, a couple of pearls that, that we've learned. Um, the way to really test for VIT is to test for the analogous condition, to test for HIT. You want to find those antiplatelet factor IV antibodies. Um, we have learned through experience and through formal testing that an enzyme immunoassay is required to find these antibodies. Some of us around the country are using rapid assays for HIT that use different antigenic targets, and they appear to yield false negative results. So it's really important when you test for antibodies with HIT antibody testing that you're using an ELISA. If you're not sure what assay your lab is running, that's okay, but it's important to give a call and to find out. And then finally, when you do find those antibodies, you wanna do confirmatory testing uh, with a serotonin release assay, a functional assay. But what we have learned is that IVIG, one of the treatments for HIT, actually inhibits this reaction. So make sure you draw your samples for testing before you treat. You don't have to wait for testing to come back. It can take a little while. You can treat empirically, but get those samples sent off. Um, we are very lucky to have the National Reference Laboratory for Platelet Immunology at McMaster. They will do enzyme immunoassay testing, and they are the only center in Canada doing SRA testing. Um, and grateful to our lab directors for really working fast and, and putting together uh, a test requisition that can be accessible anywhere in this country. Um, so in the algorithm I showed you, it kind of emphasized the role of hematology or thrombosis medicine consultation if you think you have a, hit, a VIT case. So if you have those typical symptoms and the typical time frame and the typical labs, uh, please phone a friend. Uh, we're here to guide you with testing. We're also here to guide you with treatment. Treatment is very similar to autoimmune HIT. We do not give heparin and we do not give platelet transfusions. We believe they theoretically could add fuel to the fire and worsen thrombosis. 
um, we do choose first line anticoagulation with non heparin anticoagulants. Um, here in Ontario, we recommend direct oral factor 10A inhibitors like rivaroxaban, apixaban, or adoxaban if the patient's stable. Uh, that's because these are easy drugs to use and get. But certainly, if the patient is unstable or has a renal impairment, you can consider parenteral anticoagulants. Um, you can consider fondoparinux. You may want an expert to assist with that. And very key, um, IVIG one gram per kilogram daily for at least two days is what is really going to raise your platelet count, extinguish um, that, that clotting storm. And finally, I'll mention um, this is a reportable condition as a vaccine-associated adverse event, event must be reported to public health and also the regulator. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, but I will say that there's lots and lots of questions remaining. Um, Thrombosis Canada has put together a really phenomenal guide as well as a tool that you can use at the point of care. Um, the Ontario Science Table is also releasing uh, evidence-based summaries and a suite of tools for different types of physicians in different settings. We think that's gonna come out in 24 hours. Um, AstraZeneca has really seized, seized the headlines, I think, and, and caused quite a lot of worry. And, and now Janssen is coming in soon as well. Physicians have really been flooded with questions from concerned Canadians, and, and we're concerned too. I will say that this story, it, it really celebrates the strength of global collaboration, of vaccine safety and surveillance. Uh, and it's really taught us that we, we need to give patients nuanced and honest information about vaccines. Uh, we're doing our part at Thrombosis Canada to make sure you're ready to detect and manage this rare and serious adverse event. Many thanks for that, Menica. That was a great presentation and a great summary.